I um, I think this ties into uh, in uh, this book one of your discussions with the author. If I'll try to pronounce his name, Lashisky. There you go. Um, when he talks about uh, Archbishop Lefebvre's critique of Dignitatis Humanae and the confusion surrounding in that Second Vatican Council document surrounding the idea of religious liberty. So on the one hand, we have a natural right to not be coerced, of course. I mean, you know, conversion has to be a matter of uh, assenting of the will and so forth. Um, So, of course, it's not as if we have an Islamic perspective where we go around and, you know, people are forced to convert. That would be wrong. Um, But on the other hand, that does not mean that false religions have an equality of rights in public and, uh, and rights in the state. And this is where the confusion happens in Dignitatis Humanae. And I, and, um, I want to read your uh, just quick passage here from the book, your assessment about um, as the dust has settled, how we've come to see Lefebvre was correct on this critique of, of Dignitatis Humanae. And you said, it's often the case in history that people are not understood until sometime after their death. Occasionally, a certain distance is needed. Now, almost 50 years after the discussion on the meaning of religious freedom, in which Archbishop Lefebvre participated, we can see and understand more clearly the errors he identified. We can see the consequences brought about by an ambiguous understanding of religious freedom. First Assisi, now Abu Dhabi. From this perspective, we can clearly see how Archbishop Lefebvre's arguments were correct, and we can see his deep solicitude and accurate diagnosis of the dangers as early as the 60s and 70s. It happens that prophets are not recognized. His was truly a prophetic voice. And as prophets are not recognized, as was the case here, the prophetic voice of Archbishop Lefebvre was simply ignored. So how do we reckon? So, you know, I believe Lefebvre was saintly. Uh, In fact, you know, we have his picture on our wall down where, you know, by our statue of Fatima, we pray the rosary as a family. And I'm convinced that he was is vindicated historically, uh, but it is a difficult. Hmm, it's a difficult situation for pe- for many Catholics who have a great affection for John Paul II, for example, as they were obviously at odds at the end of Lefebvre's life. How can we appreciate that Lefebvre was correct in light of the fact that of the controversy laid in his life? What, what would you elaborate on that? Well. We have, we have to look first on the truth itself and to, to be really, as the Latin uh, proverb says, sine ira et studio. So to approach the question without, uh, um, so objectively and with calm and to see what is truth. So to, to examine this carefully without doing mental acrobatics or without squaring the circle, (laughs) simply to be honest, intellectually honest. Mm. And and therefore the text itself is at least highly ambiguous. Dignitat is highly ambiguous. And uh, even I would say erroneous, uh, and I, I see there are no problem because the, this is only a declaration. It is not a decree of the council. It is mm. not an ex cathedra definition. And the council did proposedly uh, ch- chosen the title only declaration. It is a very low uh, level of uh, doctrinal uh, affirmations of the church. So, and the entire council did not have the intention to propose to the faithful something definite, definitely, uh, uh, definite teaching. It said uh, uh, Paul the sixth explicitly. This was not the intention of the council. And so the dignitatis humanae. It is a new teaching uh, by the council, and therefore the council did not want to impose this in a definite manner. And therefore. We can discuss about this. We can express our critiques with respect for, this, for the love of the truth, for the love of the church, for the salvation of the souls. And this obviously demonstrated 
the interpretation of the Gendati Sumane and the practical implementation, it was a great harm for the church, for the Catholic faith, uh, because uh, it was a relativization of the uniqueness of the Catholic faith. And then it was a tool of promoting uh, religious relativism, which we, uh, which we assisted in the so-called interreligious meetings and dialogues, uh, which you mentioned, Assisi and Abu Dhabi. So, and uh, repeat, in itself, there is a confusion. So you have not, you have a natural right not to be forced in, right. in, the, in the matters of religion. Yes, this is true, but it's, it's not the, the, the full truth because there is mixtures and other this is only uh, on on faith, of course, but you you can be. Uh, uh, this is referring to the only one truth, the Catholic faith. So, but you can be forced not to spread uh, idolatry. You can be forced, and God limits you to spread s Satanism. Let us say right. it's also a religion a kind of worship. And so in this case, you have not a natural right at the same level as not to be forced to believe in the true God, in the, the true religion, because this is a, a matter, the faith is a matter of freedom, the, the true faith, but not the wrong religion. So in this case, you can limit uh, the spread and the propagation of false religions. And God uh, commanded also in, in the Holy Scripture to limit this. And the church always taught these 2,000 years until Second Vatican Council that a wrong religion, an error, has not a natural right not to be limited. So this is obvious. And I think so we, we might... To, oh, sorry, go on. Therefore, I think the contribution of Archbishop Lefebvre I consider his intervention on this topic prophetically and uh, helpful, and it was a, a solitary voice, but it is now, I, I think, after 50, 60 years, we are seeing clearer the consequences of the, of the dangerous uh, teaching of Dignitatis Humanae, and I am believing that in, some, in the future, the church will correct this uh, teaching of Dignitatis Humanae, of course, respectfully, but correct. We look back to the sense of the faith that we see at all times, especially in those great ages of faith. And when I look at a man like Marcel Lefebvre, I'm reminded of, and I wrote it down here because I know I would forget, I'm reminded of St. Eusebius of Samosote. Uh, there's different, they call him St. Eusebius of Samosote and another title, I think, is Versoi. I uh, can't remember how you pronounce it, but he was uh, an exiled bishop in the Arian crisis uh, when he returned from exile. And that term exile is interchangeable with excommunication, it seems, in the first few hundred years. Um, he went around ordaining and consecrating bishops and priests with no jurisdiction at all. And I believe he went further than Marcel Lefebvre and sort of said, this is your, your parish, this is your diocese. Um, but his justification was that the faithful have a right to the faith. Uh, they have a right to save their soul. And if the bishops are Arians and, and so forth, then this is not something that we can just stand by and watch. Now, when people hear the faithful have a right, we do live in an age of great licentiousness and, and sort of egoism with our civil rights and so forth. But when we properly understand that, at least as far as I can tell, the natural law uh, imposes on us an obligation of worshiping the true God with the true sacrifice. And we owe God this true worship out of justice for our creator. And therefore it is the church's duty to provide the faith to us because it's our duty to provide true worship to God and rights and duties go together. Does this sound like something um, that you would agree with? Yes, this is true. And it, Exactly, it were the bishops, St. Eusebius of Vercelli in Italy. He was uh, Bishop of Vercelli. That's right. North Italy. And also St. Hilary of Poitiers, they both. 
at the same mm -hmm. time they were exiled because of the fidelity to the Catholic faith, and they uh, ordained bishops uh, for the sake, for the Catholic faith, for the faithful, to provide them good pastors, good shepherds, and when uh, and it was generally in the first millennium not required for every episcopal ordination the consent, the, the explicit consent of the Pope. It was implicitly uh, expressed when the bishops uh, maintained the hierarchic, hierarchical union with the Pope, with the Bishop of Rome. It was only in the Middle Ages more explicitly concentrated a kind of centralism which is not by faith required. So to be a Catholic bishop, it is not by divine law that the selection should be done by the Pope and the conse right. every consecration uh, explicit ad hoc agree uh, uh, agreement of the Pope. Uh, but it was simply required by divine law that the, the co consecrated bishop is expressing uh, fully and exteriorly his union with the bishop, bishop of Rome, with the Pope. Mm -hmm. And this he is doing, mentioning the Pope in the canon. This is the, the deepest union possible in the church to the Holy Eucharist. And when the Pope, and when a bishop is publicly uh, recognizing the Pope as the, the vicar of Christ, it is sufficient. And right. it's, it would be, uh, and we had this, I repeat, exaggerated papalism started after the Council of Trent. Of course, understandably, uh, understand it was understandable because of the attacks of the Protestants, but it was a humanly situation that the understanding of the papal office was too much, um, it was uh, exaggerated, it was not so necessary. But maybe the, the historical circumstances, but we have to return again uh, to see the crisis of the church and therefore the consecrations which Archbishop Lefebvre did by the bishops were in no, case, in no way schismatics. He did not have this intention and he did this for the sake for the church, for the love for the Pope, for the love for the Holy See, for the honor of the Holy See. And this is sufficient. And he mentions the Pope in, in the canon and the new bishops ordained by him also. And this is sufficient because the, the, the historical circumstances are so grievous, even under the, under the pontificate of John Paul II, it was so much confusion and it was continued the spread of the, the, the wrong uh, interreligious dialogue and ecumenism, which was ultimately undermining the, the truth of the uniqueness of the Catholic Church and then also the liturgy, the disaster of the liturgy was even under John Paul II still mm -hmm. there operating, the deep crisis. And so I think that in the light of the 2000 years of the church, uh, that what uh, Archbishop Lefebvre did, even with his, it was apparently ad literam to the latter, illegal, the consecrations of the bishops which he did, but it was in an extraordinary situation and with a pure uh, intention to be in union with the Pope dogmatically and canonically as it did the bishops, St. Eusebius, St. Hilarius and Athanasius. Yes. Even when Athanasius was excommunicated by Pope Liberius, he continued to, to consecrate bishops in Egypt because he was the primate of, of Egypt. And but he did this uh, in interior union with the Pope, and he he even he he excused the Pope in one of his writings that he did this excommunication under pressure and so on. So he was very um, delicate, but he continued his work for the love, for the Church, for the truth.